Now this morning, I'm going to tell you this morning, God has something to do today that I believe is going to be new and fresh for so many in this room. I need you to know right now, don't be thinking, oh, I wish this was, a, this was for somebody else here today. I want you to start with, God, you have something for me today. In fact, um, we are in the book of Acts, and we're getting back into Acts, so you can turn there to Acts 19. And while you're turning there, I want to say a couple things about where we are on the journey of why this is so important where we're at. This is the third missionary journey that we are now looking at in the book of Acts. Paul has already gone on two separate missionary trips where churches have been planted, lives have been saved, people have come to Christ, and, and people are spreading the word. Things are reproducing. There are people who are beginning to understand that you can't keep what you learn inside and keep it in. You gotta let it out. You gotta freely give out of what you have freely received. So in Acts 19, one of the interesting things is, is that Paul is now going back to one of the cities he's been in, which is Ephesus, and he is about to notice when he arrives, listen to this, that the people who are affirming faith in the Lord, the people who are saying they're Christians or the people who are saying, yeah, we're in, Paul's like, you're in, but something's off. Something's missing. Something's missing lacking. Today's message is entitled, Is Something Lacking? That's a question for you to answer in your spiritual life. Is there something you know is just, I feel like I still need a breakthrough. I feel like I still need to understand how to get past this hump. I'm in the same place all the time. I feel like I'm the children of Israel just wandering in the wilderness. Maybe you don't really understand what the ministry of the Holy Spirit actually means for a true believer in Christ. Tune in today. Listen carefully today. Lean in. Today, God wants to fill what is lacking in your faith because we're going to see exactly this situation as Paul shows up in Ephesus. So we're going to read the first 10 verses. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning? as we let the word of God just resonate in our hearts this morning. Acts 19, beginning in verse one. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit, when you believed. I'm going to say that again. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Hmm. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But, <coughs> excuse me, but when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude. He departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. This is God's word for us this morning. Let's pray for understanding. Father, as we've read this word, as we've considered the situation. 
It was true then. It is true now. So many people are living their lives, missing out on the fullness of what is available to them. Holy Spirit, be our teacher today. Jesus, be glorified today. Father, have your way in all of our hearts. Because in this place, God is an opportunity for growth, renewal, healing, restoration, understanding, wisdom. Lord, would you grant us what we need and would you fill what is lacking in our faith? We ask you to do that for your glory and for the building up of your church. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Please grab a seat, my dear brothers and sisters. <clears throat> you may have heard this week that one of the most famous atheists alive in our world today Richard Dawkins, a man out of Oxford, England. He's from the other city. I spent 10 years in Cambridge, so we call that the other city. And Richard Dawkins made an interesting public statement in an interview this past week. Some of you may have heard it. This past week, which ended Ramadan, the most important holiday for Muslim people, all throughout London and other places of England, there were holograms, pictures of Allah, his name, all over England. It was like a Muslim, uh, in a sense, um, stamp all over the country of England this past week at the end of Ramadan, which ended last weekend. Now, Richard Dawkins, who doesn't believe in God, by the way, he does not believe in God, came out and said, I'm a cultural Christian. What does that even mean, right? Your response. Here's what he, he, he meant by it. He says, I quote, I call myself a cultural Christian. I'm not a believer. But there's a distinction between a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian. He goes on to say, I love hymns and Christmas carols. And I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos, we, that is in the UK, are a Christian country in that sense. Now, he said this, <coughs> excuse me, he said this after being horrified by what he saw in the Islamic displays that were throughout the country. Because to him, this was like not English. This was no longer British. This was like a foreign invasion to him of their culture. So he said let me just finish his quote. He said, if I had to choose between Christianity and Islam, I'd choose Christianity every single time. It seems to me to be a fundamentally decent religion in a way I think Islam is not, end quote. I, I wanted to share this because Richard Dawkins is lacking all kinds of faith in God. He doesn't understand who Jesus is, doesn't believe who Jesus is, but he wants to borrow the good things about Christianity. He has said in his book, The God Delusion, that he has to agree that people who believe in Christian morals helps the world make, become a better place. He actually said, I must admit that I would much rather people have a fear of God in our world than to have no fear of God because it makes us safer. It makes the world a better place because people show restraint rather than doing whatever they want if they actually believe there's a judge up there, if, if they believe there's an actual holy God that has given us holy commandments and holy laws. So, so um, thank you, sweetheart. Um, when you think about those things, understand, brothers and sisters, that the world would not even be remotely as healthy and as whole as it is today with all the messing, uh, with all the, the, the massive chaos that's in our world, it would be worse. It would be far worse. In fact, in the days of the flood, the Bible says the heart of man was only evil continually. That's not the case today because there are people praying against evil. There are people praying against sin. There is wickedness being restrained. Hospitals were birthed from Christians. 
Universities were first birthed, including Oxford and Cambridge, and ones in our country like Harvard and Yale and William and Mary, each one of those colleges were started to train up ministers to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. But people who say, I don't want Jesus, you know what they want? But I want the effects of Jesus. I don't want God, but I want the morality to exist in our culture. I don't want to change my life, but I hope a lot of other people change theirs because it'll make my life a lot healthier and safer. Do you, do you guys see the incredible inconsistency of that worldview? That you're saying, I don't believe in the source, but I sure like the benefits. You see, even Richard Dawkins can admit such things. And I can't help but say, in our world today, if you actually reason with some people, you would have to say to them, if you believe anything's evil at all in the world, you are giving credence to God. Because if there's no God, there's no moral lawgiver. And if there's no moral lawgiver, morality is a made-up concept. So the moment you say something is wrong, like murder, or rape, or stealing, or lying, the moment you say those are wrong, you're essentially indirectly saying there's a God who told us and put in our conscience things that are right, things that are true things that are just. The world is lacking understanding today. In fact, the prophet Hosea said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Today, we're going to see what happens even in the church when we're lacking more of what God has for us. So as we tune in and dive into this passage of scripture, perhaps we all need to realize, believer and non-believer alike, there are things that may be lacking that God says, I need to fill that. I need to, I need to realign you with what I intend for you to have. So we dive in now in Acts chapter 19, and it says, it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and he found some disciples. Now, it's worth noting this. These disciples who were in Ephesus may, we don't know for sure because it doesn't say, but may have come to the faith through Apollos at an earlier time. I know it's been a few weeks since we were in Acts. So do you remember the last time we were in Acts, Apollos was preaching eloquently scriptures pertaining to the coming Messiah, but he needed to be pulled aside by Aquila and Priscilla, and he needed to be shown more accurately the way of the Lord. Since he was not fully mature, since he didn't have a full understanding, whatever ministry he had in Ephesus was incomplete. Which means that if these disciples were influenced by Apollos, chances are you can only take someone as far as you have gone or are willing to go. If Apollos hadn't gone that far yet, he can only make disciples to the degree in which he is a disciple. He can only teach to the degree in which he understands. He could only help people to the degree in which he's been helped. So what's happened now is Apollos, the leader, he's been strengthened and fortified and poured into by Aquila and Priscilla. And now, and then of course, Paul um, would, would reinforce this, but now Paul shows up at the place where Apollos once was and he notices disciples and he can, listen, immediately discern something's not right in these disciples. He has discernment. He spiritually can, I don't know what it was. Was it he heard them talking and he could say, boy, your theology is a little off. Did he see them worship and they were like, you guys are worshiping like the God of the Old Testament, but you don't really understand the worship in spirit and in truth. Was it a lack of love? There was no fruit of the spirit in their life. Well, one thing we're gonna dive in and see is there are multiple things that may have been off, but the one specific thing that's directed that, that Paul directs their attention to is, do you understand the person of the Holy Spirit? Do you know who he is? So Paul, seeing these disciples, goes up to them, verse two, and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, this is not a normal question that a Christian would have for other Christians. On the one hand, every Christian has the Holy Spirit. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But clearly, 
These disciples were missing something so essential in the faith. In fact, Paul discerned that something was spiritually off among these disciples. Something was lacking in their faith. And I can't help but say, that's not too uncommon today. My question for you is, is there something lacking in your faith? Is there something spiritually missing? Something that you would say, I don't know what it is, but I feel like I just don't have victory. I feel like I never seem to have a a constant peace. I feel like I'm constantly wavering. I'm constantly shaken. And, And believe me, all Christians, don't get me wrong, all Christians can waver in our faith. All true believers and followers of Jesus have moments of doubt or moments of discouragement or moments of even falling into sin. I think that's safe to say every Christian in this room has sinned since you've been saved, right? I have. I've been saved for 37 years. But over those 37 years, I've sinned three times. (laughs) No, no, no. I've sinned more times than I probably could count or know or understand. I, 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 like you, have had many times where the Holy Spirit had to shed light on me and go, Joey, you are off there in your attitude or your heart or you got prideful or you, you were turning your eyes in the wrong places. You were jealous about something. You were envious about something. You were insecure about something. You were um, worried about too many things. You were whatever it may be. You know, the reality is God is reorienting our hearts to him all the time. We're re- the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In case you didn't know, that's not a one-time experience. I have to renew my mind every single day in Jesus. So let's go back to the understanding that. Why would Paul say, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, first of all, do you notice what Paul is doing? He's not saying you're not a Christian. He could have just started that way and said, I don't believe you guys are saved. But how can Paul fully know that? Only God can truly know what's in the heart of a man. He can't go around saying, you're not saved, you're not saved, but he can ask the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Because first he gives them the benefit of the doubt. You say you are believers, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Now, based on how they respond to that question, we'll give a whole level of understanding as to where they're really at in their maturity and in their experience as followers of Christ. Now, let me make this very clear from the beginning. I need to, I'm going to build some foundational things, so I need you to pay attention to the order in which I say these things. Listen to this. In John 1.12, it says, to as many as receive Jesus, God gives them the right to become children of God. So the moment you believe in Jesus, you are a child of God. You, you don't have to earn your way. You don't graduate and become a child of God. It would be interesting if, if Christianity meant uh, you have to read the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and when you finally read the last words of Revelation, you can close the book and say, I graduated, I read the Bible, and I've earned my stripes. Now, the Bible says that by his stripes, you are healed. The moment you trust in Jesus and say, I need your forgiveness, I need salvation in you, you can be born again just like that. You can be a little girl. Like one of the precious daughters in our family last week came up to me at the end of the service and said, I prayed to ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And she told me and the family wanted me to be there and we prayed for her and so forth. Precious. You could do that as a child. The gospel is that, in a sense, able to be understood and received even at a young age. Now, granted, she may not have had to repent of all the things that you and I maybe have repented on based on when you came to Christ, but the Lord can speak and reveal himself even to a child. The kingdom of heaven was made for such as these. And of course, those who are not even of age of understanding have a special grace of God that the kingdom of heaven has been prepared for them. That's why I believe children who die as babies Children who die at one or two or three and these kind of things, they go straight to be with the Lord. You say, well, but does the Bible teach that? I believe it does. Remember when David had sinned with Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet revealed his sin and he said, the child will not come to you, but you will go to the child. I don't think many of you would say, well, David wasn't a believer. No, David was a believer. David was gonna go be with the Lord. That was his hope. And he would get to see the child that he didn't get to grow up with. 
or that he didn't get to raise and see grow up. I believe the Bible tells us that the kingdom of heaven was made for such as these. Children are a beautiful picture of what the kingdom of heaven is all about. Jesus says, unless you be converted as a child, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And he uses this terminology when you become a believer. As many as receive him, you become a child of God, a son or a daughter. Now, I don't understand all the aspects of you know, at what age is an age of accountability or does God hold a child responsible or a baby or, you know, like this. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. It just gives us all these other examples of what the kingdom of heaven is for and, and these things. So that's why my confidence is in that. But when you receive Jesus, let me tell you what Romans chapter eight says. Take a look at this. Every person who believes in Jesus receives the indwelling Holy Spirit. Romans eight verses nine through 11 says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Notice that that's key. To have Jesus is to have the spirit. You cannot have Jesus and not have the spirit. That's what that verse is saying. It goes on to say, and if Christ is in you, so if you have Christ and Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, and the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if you have this indwelling spirit, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So is it safe to say that if you believe Jesus and receive Jesus, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit? You're not a hollow believer you're a filled believer in that regard. But just like a person can grow in Jesus, which you'd all agree with that, right? Can you grow in your faith in Jesus? Can you grow in your understanding of Jesus? Can you grow in your obedience to Jesus? Answer is yes. Okay, good. No, there should be no no's there. Just like you can grow in Jesus, you can grow in both your understanding of the Spirit your experience with the Spirit, and the empowerment of the Spirit that enables you to live and look like Jesus. And so we need the increase of who the Lord is. In fact, Jesus once taught in Mark 4.25, for whoever has to him, say it with me, more will be given. Even what he has, or I'm sorry, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. So, so understand this. If you have Jesus, more can be given. If you don't have Jesus, if you don't have the things of God, even what you think you have will be taken away because you have nothing without Jesus. Apart from Jesus, you've got nothing. You're bankrupt. This is why the Bible starts the Sermon on the Mount saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Every true follower of Jesus has to come to a place where you kind of recognize I'm spiritually bankrupt. I'm in poverty without Jesus. I don't have anything if I don't have Jesus. The Bible tells us if you have Jesus, you have life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life and you're condemned already. At that very place you're in, you're actually a child of wrath, not a child of God. So it's very important that we understand we have to be given the right to become a child of God. So back to Paul's question. His question is, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, their response to this is interesting. They could have said, oh yes, we're born again. They could have said, well, we know we have the Spirit. Is there more? They could have said, um... We, we do have the Spirit, but we have a lot of questions. What are the gifts? Uh, I've heard about fruit of the Spirit. What does that mean? Um, what, 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 what can I do to grow in the Spirit? They could have said a lot of responses, but you know what they said? Everybody look at their response. They said, verse 2, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now that's interesting because... If they read the Old Testament scriptures, even in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, they would have known there's a Holy Spirit. It's, I, I started the whole service with that, didn't I? The Spirit of the Lord hovers over the face of the deep. You can't even read two verses in the Old Testament scriptures and not know about the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, 
The Spirit of God came upon every prophet and priest and even the judges like Gideon and and Deborah and uh, Samson. How did they do those great works without the power of the Holy Spirit? So to say you've never heard of the Holy Spirit tells you a lot, doesn't it? These people are still very uninformed. Not only that, but what I also find interesting is that they don't understand that the Spirit of God was given as a gift when Jesus ascended. Do you remember he told his disciples in John 14, I'm going to go, but I'm going to leave with you the comforter, and he will teach you all things, and it's true. He will be with you, and he will be in you. We'll go back to that verse in a moment. Jesus prayed for us to receive the helper, even said this, it'll be to your advantage that I go. You're going to receive the Spirit. And these guys say, we've never even heard there is a Holy Spirit. We've never heard about this Holy Spirit. Which means that Apollos or whoever it was that led these men to the Lord, in a sense, gave them very little to go off of. And they were responsive. They're kind of like the parable of the sower. Do you guys remember in the parable of the sower, there are three grounds that are not the real ground. There's the wayside where the seed just is snatched away by the devil. That's not them but there's two other grounds. There's thorny ground where where you do receive the word, but the cares of the world choke it out. And there's stony ground where you do receive the word, but there's no depth. There's really no foundation. So the first time you get tested, you don't really have anything to stand upon because you don't have a firm enough foundation. Well, whatever the case was, these guys were not on ground four. Now, I, I was sharing with our young adults last night, there are four categories of people just like the four grounds of the seed being sown. Listen to this. Here's the first, uh, first category of people. A person who's not connected to Jesus and who's not connected to the church. That's category one. This person is lost, separated from God, dead in their sins, and they have no connection to Jesus or his people. Number one. Number two, there are some people who get connected to Jesus, but they have no connection to the church. So they have a connection, in a sense, to the source, but without the help of the community of God's people, they're kind of lost in roaming because there's not a healthy connection to the church, which is the very bride of Christ, who Christ died for and loves. Then you have an interesting third category, people connected to the church, but are not connected to Jesus. There's a lot of church-going people, listen, who are not saved. A lot of church-going people who, every week, they somehow show up with the church, And they're sitting there and they're present and they're there. But like, is there anything going on in there? Hello, you know, McFly. Is there anything going on in there? You know, it's it's like there's a spiritual absence and it's sad. This is not, this is not a good thing because the Holy Spirit wants to fill every life of every person and he wants every person to be a true child of God. So those are the first three categories. What's the fourth category then? A person connected to Jesus and connected to his bride, the church. That's the only person that will bear true fruit in the end. Because to bear true fruit, you don't just love Jesus, but you love what Jesus loves. And Jesus loves his church. He died for the church. John the apostle says, if you say you love God, but hate your brother, the truth is not in you. You're a liar. Because how can you say you love God who you don't see, but you don't love your brother or sister who you do see? You see, the true believer is connected to Christ and connected to the church and devotes their life accordingly. So whatever the case, these disciples were not in the right category, at least not in the full sense, because whether it was a disconnect from Christ or a disconnect from the church, they're not even aware of what unites us all together, which is the ministry and person of the Holy Spirit. Paul would write in Ephesians 4, we must endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You cannot endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit if you don't even know there is the Spirit and you don't even know what makes you born again and you don't know what makes another brother or sister born again. So there's a great need to understand this. So what does it mean to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, let me go back to the Sermon on the Mount again. Jesus said in Matthew 5 or 6, 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Telling you, if you're a hungry person, you're thirsting for more, God has so much more to give. That's number one. Number two, in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, Jesus says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, speaking to fathers on earth, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask him, to those who ask him? So the question then is, are these disciples even disciples of Jesus at all? Now, before we answer that question, let me say this, clear distinction. Everybody look up here. There is a distinction or a difference between misplaced faith and underdeveloped faith. You got to know the difference between these two categories. Misplaced faith. Misplaced faith would be, I believe in Jesus, but he's just a prophet. He's not God. That's what Muslims believe, by the way. Um, other groups say, I believe in Jesus, but he's not God. He is a lowercase g God. He, he's just, you know, the first of the creation of God. He's a good man, a good teacher. That's, that's called misplaced faith. That means the faith you think you have in Jesus has been misplaced. You don't understand who Jesus is, and you have a misplaced faith. Some say this, I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those born agains. How many have heard that? I always like to remind somebody who says that. I said, by the way, do you, you do realize where the born again expression comes from? Jesus is the one who said it. Like, do you have any faith in Jesus? Oh, I, I, Jesus I love. It's those born agains. Well, it, it was actually Jesus that taught us what it even meant to be born again. You have to believe in Jesus to be born again. And the idea of being born again means that you were spiritually dead in your sins, but you've been made alive in Christ. And his Holy Spirit has entered your life and joined with your human spirit. As Romans 8 verse 16 says, his spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. That's being born again. Jesus said in John 3 verse 3, unless a man is born again of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So I would, I would hate for somebody to say they believe in Jesus and they don't want to be born again because they won't see heaven. They won't see the kingdom of heaven. So being born again is not some new modern term that some Christian came up with. It's not some Pentecostal term. It's, it's not some weird term. It's, it's a basic biblical description of a true follower of Jesus Christ, being born again. Now look at what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. He says, for what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? Night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. That, dear brothers and sisters, is underdeveloped faith. This verse represents underdeveloped faith, meaning people have the right faith in the right God. They know who Jesus is, but they actually need to mature a bit. They need to grow some more. They need to understand what their faith means and produces. So Paul says, I want to help perfect what is lacking in your faith. That's the heart that Paul came to Ephesus with. And by the way, by the way, Paul told the people of Ephesus in Acts 18, 21, he says, I will return to you again. And he was true on his promise. Paul told the Ephesians he would be back there. But what he didn't know is that more people would be there who would be believers. That, that, I mean, he, he was blessed to find 12 new disciples, but the 12 new disciples he found, he's like, hmm, something's lacking. Something's lacking in your faith. Now, the question is, was it lacking that there was misplaced faith or was it lacking that it's just underdeveloped faith? Well, in some ways, Bible scholars have actually gone back and forth on this. But I'm going to give you some reasons where I would say, let's break this down. I actually think this is a good exercise to go through because every person in this room should start to think about what authenticates faith. Like, can anybody say I'm a Christian? And they go, oh, okay, you said you're a Christian? You must be a Christian. Or, hey, like Richard Dawkins, I'm a cultural Christian. I, I don't think Richard Dawkins right now has saving faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that changes. Let's pray for God to open up his eyes and the eyes of atheists and people who have those public voices against God. Let's pray for them. But 
just because you say you're a cultural Christian, that doesn't give you any points. Like he must've got 500 points to make it into heaven or something like this. It's not, a, it's not a game show. It's not like he gave a right answer. He didn't sort of give a head nod to God. God's not looking for a head nod, brothers and sisters. He's looking for a surrendered heart, a true heart of belief. So were these men in Ephesus true believers? Let's go through these bullet points for a moment. Here's what we know. First of all, the scriptures say these men were called disciples in verse one. Usually the word disciple in the Bible refers to a disciple of Jesus in the sense that Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. So the fact that they're being called disciples, one might assume that's who they are. But understand this, the word disciple preexisted Jesus's life and ministry. There were many disciples before Jesus was even born of other rabbis. And we even see this confirmed in the Gospel of John because John the Baptist, who was sent to prepare the way of the Lord, he had his own disciples. So we're, the question now is, are these disciples of Jesus or are they disciples of John? Well, let's keep reading. Maybe we'll get a better understanding. Number two bullet point. Paul acknowledges their professing faith when he says, when you believed. So they did believe in something, and they might even have believed in someone named Jesus. But did they fully grasp what that meant? You know, when somebody says, I believe in Jesus, it's good to say, well, what do you mean when you say that? Well, I believe he existed. Okay, well, that's good. So does everybody else in the world who says 2024. Because by the way, it's 2024 because the life of Jesus came into the world. So just having a belief that he existed doesn't make you saved, right? So um, Paul does acknowledge that they believed, but what does that mean? That's still being unwrapped, unpacked. Now, I, I put a space there. Those first two could look positive and say, well, I think they are believers, but they have underdeveloped faith. But these next three bullet points lead me to a question. Well, they also might have misplaced faith. Maybe it's both. That's a possibility. Here's what we know next they never heard of the Holy Spirit. That's troublesome. How come you never heard anything spoken about the Holy Spirit the whole time that you've been professing to be a disciple? Uh, what does that tell you about their understanding and, and, and they need the Holy Spirit to learn Jesus? Number two, they say in their dialogue here that they, they were only baptized in John's ministry. Let's keep reading. Look at verses three and four in our text. It says, and he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. As soon as Paul hears that, he doesn't say, oh, good. Okay, well, you're, you're good now. He says, John indeed baptized, verse four, with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. You see, listen, everyone. If you were baptized by John the Baptist, you were told there's someone coming. There's somebody coming in the future who is going to be greater than I. I, I can't even loosen his sandal straps. He's so important. He's so much greater than me. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It would make sense that if they only got baptized in John, that actually they should have heard about the Holy Spirit, right? Because it was John who introduced them that Jesus would one day baptize in the Holy Spirit. But here's the difference. Because they said they only got baptized in John's baptism, it may be that they only knew about repenting of their sins and putting their trust that the Messiah has come, but they haven't actually come to the Messiah in fullness to put their full trust in him or to receive the fullness of what he has to bring. When Peter stood up at Pentecost and the people said, what must we do now? What, what shall we do? He says this, repent, good. John the Baptist taught that. And he says, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And the reason why Peter said that is because Jesus has already died for our sins. So in a sense, by saying be baptized for the remission of your sins, it's also saying, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you and rose again. That raises a question to a lot of scholars and Bible teachers. Did these guys ever truly become born again? Did they ever receive Jesus into their lives? Well, they got baptized a second time. Look at what the last bullet point says. They ended up getting baptized again in the name of Jesus. 
Now that doesn't mean they got baptized, you know, only in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It sounds to me like they didn't know the Spirit. So that means they didn't even get baptized the way John baptized or the way that, in a sense, um, the disciples were told by Jesus to baptize. John just said, repent and get cleansed. Prepare the way of the Lord, in a sense. But being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, or being baptized in the name of Jesus is one and the same thing. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And of course, in Colossians 2, it says that in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. Now, now everybody, listen in. I need you to just make this personal for a moment. When you got baptized, did you have faith in Jesus when you got baptized? I got baptized as a baby because my parents raised us in the Catholic church and we, uh, my parents followed the Catholic you know, ways and so forth. And so I got baptized as a baby. I don't remember it. If you got baptized as a baby, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, you probably don't remember it either. Simply because when you're a baby, how much can you really remember? But the Bible says, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And baptism follows next. That means if you don't have an understanding to repent and you don't have an understanding to believe in Jesus, your baptism is entirely based upon the community of God's people and your parents first, not so much yourself because you are not involved in that on a personal level. Now, there are Christians today who do infant baptism. There are Christians today who say, well, as long as we do this baptism, they can be a part of the community. And when they get older, they can confirm their faith. The thing is, is that to not experience your baptism allows you not to understand the beauty of identifying with Jesus, not just into the community of God's people, but into the redemptive work of God, where Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. What baptism means in Greek is the Greek word baptizo, and it means to be immersed. So one, they don't even really immerse babies, they sprinkle, but secondly... By the way, the Catholic Church used to, and some got drowned, and some actually got poisoned, and some were actually given wine, and they got really sick. So they've made a lot of changes over the years. But what's interesting is that a, a person who believes in Jesus and repents goes underneath the water, death and burial, comes up out of the water in resurrection, and you identify with the gospel. You identify with who Jesus is and what he's done. That's why, personally, I got baptized later again when I put my trust in Jesus and I believed and I wanted Jesus in my life and I got baptized there in Corona del Mar in Pirate's Cove where some of you might remember the Jesus Revolution movie and I got baptized in that same spot by Chuck Smith in that very place in that water and that was where I got baptized. Now, some of us say, well, I've grown in my faith since then. Well, if you have underdeveloped faith when you get baptized, that doesn't mean every time you develop faith, you should get rebaptized and get rebaptized and get rebaptized. Baptism isn't one of those things you use per se as a way of every time you hit a milestone in your Christian walk. But it should be that you have a recollection of a time where you can say, I understood what I was doing. I understood that I was putting my faith and trust in Jesus. Now, can we go to the next slide, guys? Because I, I need your help on this um, for there. It says that there are three Greek prepositions that the baptism and the work of the Holy Spirit shows us in the New Testament. Um, this is something that has been pointed out by various scholars, but it's, it's an interesting just relational aspect of the way the Holy Spirit works with us experientially. First of all, the relationship between the Holy Spirit and a believer looks like this. First of all, the Spirit comes to be with us. The Greek word or preposition is para, para, right? It means with, like paraclete, parakletos. He's the helper. So we have the spirit is with you. Then we also have in or en in the Greek, which means the spirit comes to be in you. But then there's this third word that's used at different points of scripture, which is the Greek word api, E-P-I, api. And that is, that should say api there. We've got a pun again there, right? But the Greek word is api. And so it's the spirit is upon you. So in the New Testament, we have these three Greek, preposi Greek prep prepositions, para, en, and api. Maybe you guys can change that upon there to say epi, and, and they can see it. But the thing that I want you to realize is, is that when Jesus told his disciples that he was alive, that he came back from the dead in John 20, 
we read in John chapter 20 that Jesus shows up. If you want to hold your place in Acts 18, let me just read it to you. But in John chapter 20, Jesus shows up to his disciples who are all, you know, stuck together in a house. And he says, peace to you as the father, I'm sorry, peace be with you. That's the first thing he says. And then in John 20, verse 20, he says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. We talked about this over on Resurrection Sunday. Then look at verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the father has sent me, I also send you. Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now some would say, I think that was just a a sign or a symbol of what was to come. I don't believe that. I believe the fact that he didn't just say it. That would be great if he said, hey, receive the Spirit. Like, as in to say, in the near future, you're going to receive the Spirit. But it says specifically in the text, he breathed on them. Those are very key words. The fact that Jesus breathed on them, as he said the words, was him releasing the Spirit into them. I believe that's what allowed the disciples who were used to scatter and who used to go away from Jesus, who used to argue over who was the greatest, now they were regenerated. They were indwelt with the Spirit. The Spirit came in them. And now, thanks guys, you got the EPI on there, great. So the Spirit was in them, but now Jesus would say something else to them. He would say, after he breathed into them the Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter one, And also in the end of Luke's gospel, he told them, go to Jerusalem and wait there and tarry for you shall receive or be endowed with power not many days from now. That's what he says in Luke. Then in in Acts 1, it says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There's the EPI. The Spirit will come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, by the way, the Spirit coming upon you is not a second Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that indwells a believer is the same Holy Spirit that is indwelling any other believer who the Spirit is upon. When the Spirit is upon someone, or another way you could just say it is on someone, you can get rid of the up and just say when the Spirit's on someone. The idea there is that the Spirit is at work giving power so that you can be a witness to him. And this is so key because for so many of us, we often get caught up on the phraseology of these things. But in actuality, brothers and sisters, there is so much more to experience with the Holy Spirit. Forget the the semantics. Forget the language for a moment. Just ask yourself this question. Since you've been a Christian, have you grown in things? Have you experienced more of Jesus? Didn't Jesus say to him who has more will be given. Well, I believe these disciples at Pentecost already had this spirit in them, but they needed this spirit upon them. In other words, they needed this spirit working on their lives so they could do for the Lord what only God could do through them, which was to have power. In the same way, by the way, I'll use Jesus as the example. When Jesus was born, doesn't it say that the Holy Spirit conceived in Mary that Jesus would be born? The whole reason why Mary had a baby as a virgin is because the Holy Spirit conceived in Mary. And doesn't it say in Luke chapter one, in chapter two, when you read the Christmas story, so to speak, that Jesus was filled with the Spirit and that he was growing in the Spirit and he grew in spirit and wisdom? Well, why is it then that at the baptism of Jesus when he was 30 years old, does it say the heavens opened and the Spirit came, what? Upon him. Because he's about to go into ministry and he needed the power to do ministry. Let me tell you, power always needs a purpose, and God's purpose always requires power. So Jesus received power at the inauguration of his ministry. Well, what was the book of Acts chapter two? The inauguration of the church's ministry. They received the spirit after the resurrection, but they received the spirit in fullness as it would relate in power at Pentecost. And I think that's an important distinction. Personally, I do believe this is a helpful way to see some of this, but it's not perfect. 
I know good Bible teachers and scholars will say, yeah, but there are times when the in reality is also a reference of the upon reality. That's true, actually. There's some interchangeable ways to use these phrases. But I would say this. I've never met a Christian who would say, are you always in the same place in your spiritual life when it comes to experiencing God and experiencing his power? I don't know about you, but there are times when I feel like I need a fresh filling of power. And is there any place in the whole New Testament that tells you we should be filled continually? Oh, there is. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, do n he's writing to believers who have the Holy Spirit because Paul calls them saints. He calls them brethren. He calls them the church. And he says in Ephesians 5, 18, do not be drunk in wine or with wine in which is dissipation. Don't let liquor intoxicate you but rather be ye continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Let God's power intoxicate you, so to speak, or better put, control you, empower you, and enable you to live the life you're meant to live. And it overflows in a love for the church, in spiritual songs and hymns, spiritual songs singing with grace and melody in your hearts to the Lord. So brothers and sisters, this is so key to understand this. So everybody look up here for a minute. When Jesus told his disciples about the Holy Spirit, this is what he said. Look at how he described the roles. Everybody look carefully. John 14, verses 16, 18. It might help to look up here because you'll see what I've underlined. It says, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells, listen to this, with you. That's the Greek word para, Para. He dwells with you and will be in you. That's the Greek word en, E-N. He'll be in you. And I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. That's the idea of the Spirit will come upon you. He will come to be fully on your life. Even in this passage, you can see this idea of all of these realities. But I also want to point out to you this. There's a difference between the reality of the person of the Holy Spirit and the experience with the reality of the Holy Spirit. It'd be like this. When I go home after church today, I'll be with my wife, Tiffany. Now, the entire time I'm in the same house with my wife, Tiffany, we will be married, just as married as we were yesterday and just as married as we will be tomorrow. But if we spend time together talking and sharing time together, my experience with the reality of my marriage enhances because I'm spending time with her. I'm interested in her. I'm looking at her. I'm, I'm enjoying the presence of the reality that I'm married with my wife, you see. Same thing in Christianity. The reality of the Holy Spirit is always with you. You never will have Jesus leave you nor forsake you, but your experience with the person of the Holy Spirit, your experience with the risen Christ who dwells in you, can enhance and grow significantly and spontaneously and continuously based on your willingness to yield, surrender, and give time. I believe this is so vital and so important because there's the indwelling of the Spirit and there's the outpouring of the Spirit. Can we go to the next slide? In the next slide, you'll see this. Jesus told them in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. So Jesus came to them when the Spirit came upon them. So I want you to understand, Jesus and the Spirit are synonymous when we talk about the indwelling life. If I asked you guys the question, who's dwelling in you, the Spirit or Jesus? You can say? Yes. yes. Very good. Jesus came to them and the Spirit came upon them, okay? Um, so there's that reality, but go to the next slide. This is important. Look at this next one. Um, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said something about this that I think is really key. Listen to this quote. He says, you know when the Spirit of God comes even upon the most ordinary man, he can make a giant out of him that can shake a meeting. I'm sorry, you know when the Spirit of God comes even upon the most ordinary man, for he can make a giant out of him that can shake a meeting and pass on as an inspiration to others and transform them. He goes on to say, that is God's way. That is the Christian church. That is the New Testament Christianity. It is the only Christianity that is worthy talking about at all. 
This is the thing that is needed, and this is one of the manifestations of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That there's a transformative reality. That, that's the point. There's evidence of his residence. I don't know about you, but if Jesus came over to your house, you would know it. If you were living in the first century and Jesus showed up at Zacchaeus' house, do you think there was some change happening in Zacchaeus' house? What did he say when he left that place? Salvation has come to this house, for this too is a true son of Abraham. He's a true Israelite. You know, this is the point. Jesus in our lives transforms us. Christ in us is the hope of glory, and Christ is the changing factor of our story. Everything changes when Jesus enters in. Let's go to the next slide. So we got two experiences. Take a look up here. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit where Jesus breathed into the disciples the Holy Spirit. John 20, verse 21 and 22 there, right? Then comes the outpouring of the Spirit. Jesus told his disciples to wait for power and when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So there's this additional reality of power that is still able to be experienced. Now you say, I want more of that experience with the Holy Spirit. Well, there are three things that could be stopping that. Number one, ignorance. You just may not know about the Holy Spirit. Kind of like these guys in Ephesus. You don't really know much about the Holy Spirit, and there could be ignorance. Number two, interference. Something's getting in the way. Sin is getting in the way. Pride is getting in the way. How about just your own personal resistance? You might be saying, I don't want to experience whatever the Holy Spirit has for me because I have no desire to be used of God or I don't want to fulfill the purpose of God. Listen, if anyone in this room wants to fulfill the purpose of God, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't go up against this world and conquer sin and conquer the flesh and conquer the devil and conquer this world in your own strength. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nada in Spanish. <laughs> nothing, nothing, no thing, but everything is possible with God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, including contentment in life. That's what that whole passage is about, by the way. Finding contentment with whatever I have. But there's one more area besides ignorance or interference that could be getting in the way. How about this one? Indifference. I can't be bothered. I don't care. Why are you talking about this, Joey? I have other things I could be, you know, why don't we do a Bible study on another topic? Well, first of all, um, the Bible is telling us in Acts 19 what happened. As a Bible teacher, I'm just telling you what went on as this took place in the book of Acts. And I pray when I study a text of scripture, God, give me what is needed for this church. Speak to me, through me, to your people so that your people today can have what is lacking in their life made full, that you will experience more of what God has for you. Let's go to this next quote. The human spirit fails unless the Holy Spirit fills. This is so vital because when you think about this, our spirit will always let us down, but his spirit will always pick us up. Our spirit will always fall short. His spirit will always lift us up and enable us to do what we could not do on our own. The question is not whether you have the Holy Spirit. The question is always whether the Holy Spirit has you. Are you under his control? Do you know what he is capable of and what he is able to do in and through our lives? So these men, back to our text, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, verse five. And verse six says, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit upheed them, upon them, came upon them, on them for power. The Spirit of God came on them. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, by the way, can I just say this? I don't believe the only evidence of the residence of the Spirit being in a person or upon a person means you speak in tongues or that you prophesy the moment you receive the Spirit. Those were two areas we do see prominent in the early church because it was a sign to the unbelievers. It was also a way of inaugurating the Gentiles in Acts 10. The spirit came upon the Gentiles and they spoke in tongues. So they were inaugurated in the Jews in Pentecost in Acts 2. They were inaugurated. And you could say the tongues was inauguration as a sign. That's true. But tongues are not only 
for a sign. If you read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, you'll discover the most excellent thing about the Holy Spirit is the fruit. Ladies, you should all be nodding now because you've been studying the fruit of the Spirit. The most important thing about the Holy Spirit is that the Spirit of God produces more of Christ in your life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Galatians 5, 22, and 23. Greatest thing the Holy Spirit does? Make you a loving person. Greatest thing the Holy Spirit does? Gives you love that produces joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of that. That's what the Holy Spirit will do in your life. He'll, he'll, he'll make you have an outgrowth of Christ, uh, uh, Christ. He will make you have an outgrowth of the person who dwells in you. The root has an offshoot that produces fruit. The root is Jesus. The offshoot is the work of the Spirit. And then out comes the fruit of Christ. That's the work of the Spirit. In addition, he gives gifts. The gifts allow you to help build up others, expand the kingdom, and fulfill the mission of God for your life. We need more of the power, which helps to release the gifts, which helps to build up the body of Christ. Every believer has gifts. Some have more than others. In a sense, every believer has the Holy Spirit, so you have the latent potential for all the gifts. If you think about it, all the gifts are wrapped up in the person of the Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have the potential for all gifts. Some have certain gifts more than others. Some of us are graced more than others. The Bible says he chooses individually what gifts you have. 1 Corinthians 12, he gives to each one individually as he chooses. So with that said, dear church, I leave it to you today. Do you feel like something is lacking in your faith? Do you feel like something is missing because maybe God wants to help you speak in an unknown tongue for your prayer language? I received that when I was 16 years old in the quietness of my own room, praying to the Father in the secret place, saying, God, I want you to use my life, pour out your Holy Spirit upon me, and I began to speak in tongues. Over the years, I've seen many, many different gifts work through my life, some more prominent than others, some more continuous than others, but I've realized the Spirit of God can work through me however he chooses, whenever he chooses, with whoever he chooses, because it's a work of God in and through us. Furthermore, it's that very Spirit that gives you boldness to speak things that you don't think you could speak. If you look at verse 8, it says, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. Do you guys know this is a record for Paul? Every other where in the book of Acts, when he spoke in a synagogue, he was out of there in a week or two. They were kicking him out. But as he was even growing in the power of the Spirit, perhaps his messages became more emboldened, more empowered. But whatever the case, don't ever measure ministry by the results. Make sure you that. Never measure ministry by the results because that's up to God. But boldness continued to be an active part of Paul's ministry. And he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. When some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, then Paul departed, and he withdrew from the disciples, and he reasoned daily in a school called Tyrannus. Uh, we have a school of Tyrannus in our church, but we call it the school of Christ. Just a place of deeper discipleship to go deeper in equipping people for ministry and helping them to understand how to grow in the kingdom of God, how to grow in Mary. Say it, Mary. Die. Die. Yes, yes. Mary will tell you. The school of Christ will teach you how to keep dying to yourself. If you ever just need a reminder of what you need to do in your Christian life, just go to Mary and she'll look at you and she'll say, die. die. That's it. All right. That, that's our dear sister Mary for you. Um, I, I think it should be followed, dear Mary, with live Christ. All right. Die to self and, and live Christ. All right. So, so if you say die, Gina, can you, can you say live? Can, live. All right. So so when you're struggling with your sin and your flesh, go to Mary. She'll say, die. And when you need to know, now what? I want to grow. Go to Gina. She'll say, live, okay? That'll be a new thing in our church, all right? We'll just kind of keep it going, you know? But ultimately, brothers and sisters, God wants to change and transform your life. Charles Spurgeon said this, quote, can we put this quote up? Give a man an electric shock and I warrant you, he will know it. But if he has the Holy Ghost, he will know it much more. So if you've never experienced the Spirit, let me just ask you, have you ever felt a shock before in your body from electricity, right? I have. 
And it's a weird feeling, right? When you feel this electrical pulse go inside of you, you know? Some of you, maybe more than others, and if you had it for too long, you're no longer with us, and we just look forward to being reunited with you one day in heaven. The reality is it could kill you. But here's the beautiful point. The Holy Spirit, when he comes upon you, is greater than an electrical charge. There's just power and joy and life in the Spirit. And he gives you the ability to be more than you are. He doesn't make you better than someone else. He makes better than yourself. He gives you new power, fresh life. And God can do that through all of us as we put our trust in him. Beloved, what is it that God wants to show you is lacking in your faith? Is it lack of love? Lack of the fruit? Is it lack of gifts? Is it lack of power? Is it lack of understanding? Is it lack of this, lack of that? We'll close with this verse. Guys, could you put the very last verse up from 1 Corinthians? The very last verse I want to show you today. We're just going to skip to this last verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says this. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. You know you're a Christian. It's been confirmed. You know this, but... Paul prayed this, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also conform you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until the day we see Jesus face to face, keep praying for grace upon grace, grace upon grace. God has more to give, more to show, more to reveal. And, and, and even this, more experience that will produce evidence of his residence in your life. God just wants to take you more intimately with him. He wants you to go deeper into his presence, into union and communion with him, experiencing all that he has for you. And that's my prayer, but it's God's prayer. It's what Jesus is praying for you this morning. Would you bow your hearts with me? Father, I ask this morning, I ask now, Jesus, that you will reveal yourself to everyone in this place. That God, you will show your power, you will show your goodness, you will show your grace, you will fill us with your Holy Spirit. You will give us fresh power, fresh anointing. Jesus, if we find that we don't really understand some things, Lord, I pray some would even ask questions and say, can you explain this a bit further? If some, Lord, do understand it, but they're saying, I just don't feel like I've ever experienced that power of the Spirit. God, I pray. They would remember it's not about feelings. It's not about emotion. It's about greater surrender and obedience to just say, God, have your way in me. Lord, I pray that every one of us will say more of you, Jesus more of you, that we will say, I must die to myself, but you must live in me. And in that exchanged life, you rearrange our priorities, you change our heart, and you exchange our poverty for your riches, our limitations for your enablings. And God, I pray that we would experience, even today, the oil of joy for morning the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness, beauty for ashes. Lord, cause us to be filled today. I pray, Lord, that we would say, I want that power today. I'm gonna invite those who are on our prayer team to come up. And while we stay in an attitude of prayer, I'm gonna ask, do you feel like something is lacking in your spiritual life? Do you feel like something just doesn't feel complete or not full and you're just like, Lord, I don't know what that means yet, but I just want to know that I am wanting the fullness, that I am asking for the fullness. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. May you invite God to have his way right now. And there will be those who will just lay hands and pray over you today for that fresh filling of the Spirit, for an empowering of the Spirit, for an increase of Christ, a growth in love, an enlargement of your heart for the things of God.